In this video, I provide an overview of the theory and application of multiple linear regression. So previously we talked about a simple linear regression in which we're using one predictor or x variable to predict a score on a single outcome or y variable. And so uh, we learned how to do that. Um, and our ability to do that depends on a correlation between the x and y variable. And it, and it works pretty well as far as our ability to use one predictor to predict an outcome. But if we wanted to use multiple predictors to predict that single outcome, we can still use the process of linear regression, except now it becomes multiple linear regression. So now we're going to have multiple x variables or multiple predictor variables that could then help us predict the y variable. And this tends to be a lot more practical in the sense that there's rarely just one variable that predicts or has the ability to predict an outcome. There might be several variables that kind of work together to predict that outcome or at least allow us to have a better prediction of that outcome. So the equation that we use is, is exactly the same as what we used with, with simple linear regression, except now we have the addition of a second x variable or second potential x score. So the equation stays the same. We're still trying to predict the y variable. We have a y-intercept that's going to help us do that. And then we have a slope associated with each x variable. So we'll have two slopes and we'll have two x variables. So again, the x variables are things that we will know. We will know what those particular values are. We will then use Excel to calculate the slope for each and then the y-intercept for each. And then we basically plug those values into the equation. So if we were trying to predict um, proficiency, pronunciation proficiency using a standardized assessment, how, how many correct pronunciations could someone get on a standardized assessment? And we we're using perhaps um, is our first x variable uh, the number of treatment sessions they may have received, and then perhaps um, their grade level. And then we want to use those two things to predict how well they might uh, perform on the pronunciation assessment. So we'll have, we'll know those, we'll know their, their number of treatment sessions, we will know their grade level, we'll plug those into the formula, we'll know the slope associated with each of these x variables, and we'll know the y-intercept. Plug all those values in and then we can solve for y. So that's basically how, how the process works. There's a few additional kind of preparatory steps we have to go through when we do multiple regression. Um, and we'll talk about those as we move forward. But let's just kind of review what this line of best fit actually can do for us. So along the bottom here, we have values of our potential x variables. And along this axis, the y-axis, we have the potential scores on what we want to predict our outcome. And so the equation or the model will develop this line of best fit that will then, knowing kind of the combination of what our x variable scores are, we can then use that to predict what our y score would be. And so we're getting that y-intercept uh, and we're getting the slope for our two um, x variables. So obviously with two x variables, the, the line, there's actually two lines that kind of work together. We have kind of an aggregate line that helps us predict y, but this is the basic idea of how regression works. Knowing x or the x is, we can then predict what y will be. So there are some conditions or kind of prerequisites or assumptions that we have when we do multiple linear regression, just like with regular linear regression. And one of the first is the relationship between the x variable and the y variable should be linear. There should be a relationship there between the x and y. Otherwise, if there's not, then x can't predict y. So that relationship needs to be linear, and we can determine that by looking at scatter plots of each x variable with each y variable. And we can also um, obviously look at the Pearson r value between those two to see if they are related. Um, the observations need to be independent. In other words, measuring one x variable will not affect the score on another x variable. Um, so those two x variables need to, to be independent of one another. The y variable needs to be normally distributed. Um, so whatever that value or whatever that measurement is needs to have a normal distribution. We can use the skewness score to determine that and, and check that. Again, that's part of our data screening process. 
Now, kind of a new condition that we have with multiple linear regression is we want to have a limited amount of what we call multi-collinearity. And what this speaks to is how related the x variables are to one another. Now, we know we want the x variables to, relate it, to be related to the y variable, but the x variables are very often related to each other especially if we're measuring kind of some similar aspects of, of a construct to predict an outcome. So we want some relationship between the independent variables, but we don't want too much. Because if we have too much relationship, that pretty much results in redundancy. So we have two things that might be measuring the same thing. Why do we need two of them? We can just use one of them. And when we have this redundancy in the x variables, as far as what they're measuring, um, and how much they might be related to each other, it actually will, can limit the size of, of our r value as well as our r squared value. And so these independent variables tend to confound each other. They kind of cancel the effect out of each other. And because of that, that can increase the error of our prediction. So how do we find out if x variables are interrelated? Well, we basically will do a Pearson r uh, correlation Pearson R analysis on our independent variables. Now we want them to have some relationship to each other um, because then they can work together to predict the Y variable but we don't want them to have too much um, relationship to each other. So we typically would prefer to have the independent variables have a, a correlation R value between 0.3 and 0.8. If it's less than 0.3 then they might actually be measuring opposite things, and we don't want that. Um, if they're somewhere between 0.3 and 0.8, then they're measuring some similar things, they're related, and they could probably work together to make a good prediction. If the relationship between the two variables is greater than 0.8, then there's some redundancy there. They're both measuring the same thing. And so we need to consider eliminating one of the variables um, to help improve the power of our analysis. So when we have these redundant variables, we either eliminate one of them, usually the one that has the lesser relationship with the outcome, or we could combine them in some way possibly. So uh, we want to be able to find that relationship, you know, a moderate to, to a little bit less than strong relationship between the, the x variables, but we don't want too much. Okay? So that, that's going to help us improve the strength of, of that prediction. So when we get a multiple regression output and when we look at a demonstration video in, in Excel, you'll see this. We get several output pieces of information that are useful to us. The first is the R value, and that represents the relationship between the predictors and the outcome. The R squared, or the coefficient of determination, um, for all of the independent variables, how much do the independent variables explain the variance in the outcome or the dependent variable. And again, the, the higher that R squared value is, the better the prediction will be. So if we can get to around a 50% or greater R squared value, then that indicates we're able to explain a lot of the variance in the outcome and that makes a good prediction. The SEE or standard error of the estimate, that is how much our prediction might actually vary uh, in the population, kind of the error of the prediction, and the smaller that is, the more accurate our prediction might be. And then the output is going to give us the y-intercept value, and then it's also going to give us a slope value for each of our potential x variables. So if we have two x variables, we'll have two slope values. If we have four x variables, we'll have four slope values. And then we're also going to get an ANOVA output, which will help us determine whether or not our prediction model is a statistically significant prediction model. And again, we're looking at the p-value in that ANOVA table. And if that p-value is less than 0.05, then that indicates we have a statistically significant prediction model, which is, which is what we would like to see. Now, one of, the, one of the questions that many people have when they begin to use multiple regression is, how do I decide what my x variable should be? Um, and a lot of that is somewhat trial and error. Some of that might be based upon kind of your intuition and your clinical judgment is to say, I think that these variables would probably do a good job of predicting the Y variable. Um, some of it might be based on previous research. Um, some of it might be kind of an exploratory thing where you're not sure if these might predict, so you want to try it out in this regression model. So it can be used as kind of a trial and error process as well. 
But probably one of the biggest things we need to make sure in choosing an explanatory variable is, is the explanatory variable related to the outcome? Is there a, is there a positive correlation that is reasonably strong, at least moderately strong, um, that is, you know, kind of one of the first screening things we look for. If I have an X variable that is not correlated with the Y variable, it's not going to help me predict the Y variable, so I'm not going to use it as an explanatory variable. So that's kind of, there's no really hard definition to say that this is how you choose explanatory variables. A lot of it is trial and error. A lot of it is clinical judgment. Um, and some of it might be based upon what previous research has shown, and you may want to to add some some additional new variables to that possibility. Now, how many should you have? Well, some of that's going to depend on how many subjects you have. A, a, kind of a general rule of thumb that we use is that um, you should have about 15 subjects per each independent variable. So if you've got two independent variables or x variables you want to use in your model, you should probably have at least 30 subjects. So if you have four independent variables you want to use, then you should probably have at least 60 subjects and so on. So um, that's kind of a general rule of thumb to think about. So if you only have 30 subjects you've gathered information on, then you, you probably should not try and include more than two independent variables or two explanatory variables. Um, there are power calculators out there that can help you determine um, the statistical power of your prediction based upon how many subjects you have, but that is a good rule of thumb. Now another question people ask is, well, how many explanatory variables are too many? Well, some of that's going to depend on what you're trying to predict, but generally once you get above around five or six or seven variables, you're either going to have some redundancy, some of that interrelationship, or you're going to reach a point where you're not improving the predictive capability of the model. So a lot of people's first inclination is to think of all the variables they possibly can and dump them all into the model and see how well it does. But that tends to, to actually hurt the predictive capability of the model. So you want to find the, the x variables that have a strong relationship with the y variable and have that kind of moderate relationship with each other. And if you can find four or five of those that can do a good job of predicting versus 15 of those, then it makes the model easier to use. Because if you think about it, you're going to have all these variables you have to incorporate in your, your prediction equation. So now you're going to have a, a, quite a bit of calculation to do if you've got 15 predictor variables. You need to include slopes for all of those and then actual x values for all of those. So usually in that you know five to six range of explanatory variables usually works pretty well. And one thing you can do is if you maybe start out with three variables and you think, well, I've got a pretty good model. Let's see what happens if I add one or two more. Well, you can do that. You can add those one or two more and then track the change that those might create in the R, the R squared, the SEE, and the ANOVA to see if it strengthens your model. Possibly subtracting a variable from your model might actually improve the capability of the model. So you can kind of play around, trial and error, add and subtract variables, but just track how that changes those uh, measures that give us an idea of the strength of the of the model. So the R, the R squared, the SEE, and ANOVA. So there's really no one right way to use these regression models. A lot of people, as I mentioned, use them as exploratory techniques to really start to develop a, an idea of how variables might work together to predict something. So it can be used in that way. So how do you report regression results? So once you've done your regression uh, analysis, you have all your data, how do you report that? Well, it's going to be important to make sure your results include the means, uh, the standard deviation, and the 95% confidence intervals for the mean of each group, so your x variable and your y variables. In reporting the actual regression equation, it's good to report the F-score associated with the ANOVA, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value for the ANOVA. Certainly the R-squared and the SEE should also be reported relative to your model. You also want to report the slope value and the y-intercept value, so that if someone wants to actually use your equation, they will be able to do that. So they can replicate what you've done and then actually use the equation to make predictions. So an example of how we might write that up 
is, is given here in this paragraph. So you can see the, the first line explains the analysis that we did, um, what it was we were trying to do, predicting participants' body image based upon age, um, indicate that we had a significant regression equation, and here's the information from the ANOVA table, the F score, the degrees of freedom, the P value, here's our R squared value, 0.38, which is decent, um, and then the SEE value. And then you can also then report the equation. So here's the equation. The equation will look like this. So Y equals 35.2 is the Y intercept, the 0.5 is the slope, and then here's the X variable. And so again, you can include a statement there as to the possible clinical significance of this prediction equation, and a lot of that will be based upon the R squared value and the SEE value. So again, once we when we get to close to 50% or greater of that R squared value, then uh, that's going to most likely be clinically significant. And when we look at the SEE, again, we have to think about what it is we're trying to predict. Um, you know, is this a narrow enough range so that if we do vary in our prediction, does it still fall within an area, a range of a score that we can use? So if we were trying to predict um, proficiency on a pronunciation um, assessment, you know, is a is a five percent variation in the prediction acceptable, or is that too big? So again, we have to use our clinical judgment very often to determine the clinical significance of an SEE value. And again, it depends on what it is you're measuring. So hopefully, this gives you a pretty good sense of how multiple regression works and some of the the uh, parameters and conditions we have to pay attention to as we develop these regression models. And uh, in our next form, you'll get a chance to see how it actually works in Excel. So hopefully you've uh, had a chance to learn something from this video, and we'll talk to you soon.